My name is Felix Kransky. I'm one of the cardiac electrophysiologists um, here at Confluence. I started in October. A cardiac electrophysiologist is a cardiologist that specializes in heart rhythm problems and treating them, so medications and procedures. And um, I moved here from San Diego after I finished my fellowship there. Originally, as you may hear from my uh, accent, I'm from Germany and went to medical school in Germany. Uh, now you may say, what uh, caused this guy to end up in Wenatchee? Well, um, I, had, Welcome. I had never, thank you, I had never heard of uh, Wenatchee before. I didn't know where it was, what it was, and, um, uh, but knew that one of my friends and now work partners, Roy Lin, uh, took a position here a few years ago and he got so busy that uh, he needed some help. And uh, so I want to thank the community for uh, inviting me and welcoming me so, friend so in such a friendly way here in Wenatchee. I really have enjoyed living here for the past four to five months. And uh, really, I, I love the area. Um, it feels much more like home. And uh, yes? I want to welcome you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Well, that's, that's great to hear. Thank you. Um, it, it really feels like being, uh, like more being like home. Uh, I spent some time in Texas and California and Connecticut, but uh, I, I really love this area. Uh, so, thank you again. Um, today, uh, we're here to talk about atri atrial fibrillation. And um, it is a, uh, why, why are we talking about atrial fibrillation? What is the hype? Well, it is the most common heart rhythm disorder that people will have in their lifetime. Um, one out of four people will experience atrial fibrillation in their lifetime. And it's uh, a condition that grows in numbers over the years. And as you can see on this chart, which is one of the few charts that I'm going to show during this pr presentation, um, the number of patients with atrial fibrillation was 2.2 2 million in 1995 in the United States. And it's projected to go up to 5.6 million. Some numbers say that it's going to be double uh, that number by 2050. So it's a problem that is growing in numbers. And for the state of Washington, you see areas that are, have a high prevalence of atrial fibrillation in red. Wenatchee is right in the center of, a, of an area that has a, a high prevalence of this, of this condition. So uh, up to 18.5%. Can we uh, turn up the volume a little bit more? Or I can speak up, is this better? Yeah. Okay, all right, I'll speak up a little bit more. Um, and um, the men and women will both experience it. So again, one out of four. And it doesn't matter how old you get, without having AFib, it's still one in four. So if you reach an age of 80 and you haven't had AFib yet, you still have a 25% chance of having AFib <laughs> by the time, by the time that, that you die. So it's, it's, um, it's a very common condition. And again, what is atrial fibrillation? Um, this is a, an example of, of an EKG where you see these, all these squiggly lines that represent atrial fibrillation. Uh, the most striking thing about this is that um, there is the, the heartbeat, the squiggly lines are really irregular. And that is what uh, predominantly happens with atrial fibrillation. The heart rhythm is irregular. And I'm just going to give you some very basic stuff or some very basic explanations about what atrial fibrillation is and where it occurs and what we can do about it. Um, the heart is, consists of four chambers. The right atrium, the left atrium, the right ventricle, and the left ventricle. Well, the heart doesn't look like a cartoon really. It looks a little bit more like this. And um, again, you have the right atrium up here, the left atrium up here, 
the right ventricle down here and the left ventricle down on the left side. And the heart sits in the patient's chest, so this is really the left side and this is the right side. And um, these four chambers act like a pump. So uh, they pump the blood into the body, the brain, the lungs. And because it is such a complicated pump, the heart needs an electrical system to coordinate it, just like the engine of a car. There's many parts to, to a car's engine, including the ignition system, the wiring that coordinates those different parts and pieces. And um, the lower chambers, which are called the ventricles, are basically the main engine of, that, of the car, uh, which is our body. They pump the blood into the lungs, and the left side pumps the blood into the brain and the body. The upper chambers, the atria, which are uh, affected in atrial fibrillation, are uh, helping fill the bottom chambers with blood. But the bottom chambers create the pulse, they create the heart rate, and do most of the work. Now, to coordinate um, all these four chambers and to make them squeeze at the right time, there needs to be an electrical system. And the heart's own electrical system is a complex, you know, uh, complex system with the heart's own pacemaker, the so-called sinus node, sitting in the right upper chamber. And this is where an electrical impulse here uh, in the cartoon uh, represented by the blue sort of uh, area, shade, shading, the electrical impulse then travels down to the bottom chambers via the heart's own wiring, these yellow branches. Those areas are special heart muscle cells that um, are sort of like the, the officers in, in an army. They tell the soldiers, the remaining uh, heart muscle cells, what to do. And um, that's what happens in normal rhythm. So an impulse is created up here and then travels down through the middle of the heart and spreads to both lower chambers and makes everything squeeze at the right time. And so this just represents this blue shading progressing down to the bottom chambers, making everything squeeze at the right time. With atrial fibrillation, those soldiers that are supposed to receive orders from the heart's own electrical system there are some soldiers that step out of line and do their own thing. And um, that, doesn't, that usually doesn't work very well. So with AFib, random electrical impulses, so chaotic electrical impulses, usually emanating from the left upper chamber, um, spread over the upper chamber. And these impulses, instead of occurring at 60 or 80, 90 times a minute, what the heart's own pacemaker usually does, these impulses occur at 300 impulses a minute, 350 times a minute. That's why it's called atrial fibrillation. There is this fibrillatory activity that you could see on the EKG earlier, which I'm gonna show again later. And so this fibrillatory electrical activity then ends up making the upper chambers just fibrillate instead of squeeze nicely, just fibrillate. And that has certain consequences that we're going to talk about. So again, here you see these circular cartoon uh, markings that are supposed to represent this chaotic atrial fibrillatory activity. So again, as I said, I'm going to show you the EKG again. When the atria fibrillate, then the heart rate becomes irregular, sometimes fast, and that can lead to a lot of symptoms. Down here, you see normal sinus rhythm. Uh, to, to give you an example of what normal heart rhythm looks like, uh, you have very regular impulses, electrical impulses, that create the heartbeat. 
Now, atrial fibrillation can cause a lot of symptoms. What are those symptoms? One, they cause an irregular and rapid heartbeat, as I showed you on the EKG. Atrial fibrillation can cause, in some patients, heart palpitations, which also means rapid thumping inside the chest. Can cause dizziness, sweating, and chest pain or pressure, shortness of breath, anxiety. You know, when your heart rate goes fast, that can sometimes create anxiety. And uh, a lot of patients will say that they tire more easily. So if you were able to, uh, you know, walk five blocks, some patients then st start saying, I "Can all of a sudden I can only walk a block? I know I'm in atrial fibrillation um, because I feel so so badly." Um, and then. Sometimes, rarely, uh, some patients faint or syncopize because the heart rate goes so fast that there's no effective blood flow to the brain and then patients syncopize. And the reason why uh, patients feel heart, heart palpitations or a rapid heartbeat is that, as I showed you in this slide, you have these electrical impulses, these chaotic, very fast, 300, 350 times a minute uh, impulses that are trying to get down to the bottom chambers, the bottom chambers that actually create the heart rate or the, the, um, the, the pulse rate. And um, it would be bad if 300 signals would actually be able to go down to the bottom chambers because then your heart rate would be 300 and that's not a good thing. That, that actually cannot happen because um, these impulses have, have to travel down through the middle of the heart. Um, there's only one, as you can see here, you have the heart valves, these white structures that sit between the upper and the lower chambers, and they act sort of like insulation, like uh, silicone insulation around the wire. No electrical impulses can travel down through that plane here where the heart valves sit. The only place where electrical impulses can travel from the upper to the lower chambers is the middle of the heart, the so-called AV node, the node that connects electrically the atria and the ventricles. So that's all very technical but important because this area protects the bottom chambers of the heart. It's sort of like a gatekeeper. It is impossible for 300 signals to pass down to the bottom chambers because that filters it out, that area filters it out. But still, 150 beats a minute or impulses a minute can travel down. And then your heart rate ends up being 150 beats a minute while you're just resting for no reason really, other than that atrial fibrillation is, uh, is, is doing its thing. And then you can imagine that's very uncomfortable. You just sit there, you know, relaxing and your heart races away. And AFib can lead to other problems. Um, the most important one is it can lead to stroke. So patients that have atrial fibrillation have a higher risk of experiencing stroke. And that's what we want to prevent. One of the things that we want to prevent because strokes are devastating. If you have a stroke, you could have long lasting or irreversible effects, weakness, um, uh, uh, spasticity, um, inability to speak, um, that's not something how, that's not how you would like to, you know, uh, you live. You, you want to prevent strokes at all costs. Atrial fibrillation can lead to heart failure, can lead to chronic fatigue, and additional heart rhythm problems. So patients that have already a problem with their, with uh, atrial fibrillation can have other heart rhythm problems. Sort of like when your spark plugs don't work, then sometimes the the wiring of the of the uh, the wiring is also not working correctly, and um, it can lead to this inconsistent blood supply that makes you short of breath and uh, dizzy. And atrial fibrillation is actually uh, accounting for up to a quarter of all strokes, and so someone that has no atrial fibrillation still can have a stroke. It's, you know, atrial fibrillation is not the only reason to have a stroke. 
Um, but if you have atrial fibrillation, here in red, you have a five-fold uh, risk of having a stroke. And so we want to talk a, a little bit about what we as physicians do, um, what our goals are in the therapy of atrial fibrillation. Above all, it's stroke prevention. That's the most important part. We want to avoid that at all costs, as I mentioned. Two other parts of therapy consist of heart rhythm control and heart rate control to reduce the symptoms that we talked about. Let's talk about stroke prevention. And um, stroke prevention is, consists of medications. There are, certain risks, uh, there are certain patients that have a higher risk of having a stroke with atrial fibrillation. So, you know, when a, um, atrial fibrillation can affect people at all ages, um, starting in youth even. Um, and um, patients that are 20 years old usually are not at as high a risk of a stroke with atrial fibrillation as someone in their 80s. Um, and so there are certain risk factors that um, guide us to treating patients and prescribing blood thinners to prevent stroke. And these risk factors are pretty common things that people have. High blood pressure, even when it's treated. So if your blood pressure is treated and at goal, it still consi or, uh, counts as a risk factor. Having diabetes having a history of heart failure, so a weak, a weak heart, being female, unfortunately, and then uh, being above the age of 65 gives you some, some risk points, having a prior history of a stroke, of a stroke and having a history of blood um, uh, vascular disease, so a history of heart attacks or clogged arteries in the legs, for example, that all those things give you, give you a risk point. And, uh, it tells us about um, how aggressive we need to be in preventing strokes. And the medications that you've probably heard about in the, uh, from family members uh, that may be on your medication regimen, um, and frankly, that you see on TV ads, usually followed by some ad from a law office suing that company <laughs> because any time you take a any type of, any time you take a blood thinner, there's a risk of having bleeding. That's you know just a natural potential side effect of of taking a blood thinner. Usually they're very safe drugs though, and those those uh, medications are warfarin and more recent medications, including Eliquis, Zeralto, Prodaxa, Seveza, and others that come on the market. Um, warfarin. A lot of my patients that I see in my clinic will will uh, be uh, uh, hesitant to start warfarin because there's the stigma of um, warfarin initially having been invented to, uh, as a rat poison. Uh, <laughs> but actually, actually, and that's why I put the rat up with a thumbs up, um, it's one of the safest and most studied drugs that we, that we know. Um, it's been around since the 90, 1960s, and it is a very safe drug when it's monitored, and um, is one of the most effective drugs to prevent strokes. So it is a very good medication. Sometimes a little bit of a pain in the butt to take it, but it is a very good medication. Now we're getting into a little bit more advanced stuff. Um, strokes can also be prevented with new procedures and new devices that are being brought on the market. I'm showing one device here, and I actually brought brought an example here, and I I can I will uh, let it go around if you promise me that I'll get it back. <laughs> don't don't let it vanish in your front pocket here, please. Yeah, put it in. Um, so. As I told you, blood thinners to prevent strokes 
have the most com or the, one of the most severe side effects of a blood thinner would be to experience severe bleeding. Most bleeding is trivial. You know, having a bruise on your arm or bruising easily for us as physicians is a nuisance and for you it's a, it's a nuisance but it's not a life-threatening event. It may not be pretty but if it can prevent a stroke if you take a blood thinner then I think it's worth the side effects sometimes of, of having easy bruising or bleeding a little bit longer when you cut yourself. What I'm really worried about is severe bleeding and that includes hemorrhagic strokes so bleeding inside the brain or severe GI bleeds where you bleed into your intestine and need blood transfusions and procedures and um, where it becomes you know a, an emergency to treat those those bleeding events that's what we're worried about and there are some patients that are at higher risk for bleeding just like someone can be at a higher risk for for having a stroke from AFib, there are some risk factors like falling very, very frequently or um, just having uh, some other conditions that make patients more prone to bleeding where giving a patient a blood thinner may not be the best thing to prevent strokes. But we still want to pre prevent strokes. So um, there are these new devices that we can Implant, implant into the heart via a catheter procedure that take out the area that, um, where most blood clots form in atrial fibrillation. And the one that I'm showing there is called the Watchman device. And you see the left atrium here. Um, it is implanted through the groin, so via a catheter through the groin up through the right side of the heart, crossing over here, the, the interatrial septum, and <clears throat> into the, what's called the left atrial appendage. It's sort of like a little windsock structure that's uh, an appendage to the left atrium where most blood clots form, about 95% of blood clots form there. And that little umbrella can seal off that appendage the body will, with time, over a few months, build tissue over, the, uh, over this um, wire structure and uh, basically seal off that area from the rest of the circulation and thereby reduce the risk of stroke. This procedure is really only for patients that have a high risk of bleeding. Um, blood thinners still are the gold standard of therapy and uh, prevent more strokes than, than this device. And plus, we, we don't know exactly how these devices will do over a 10, 20 year time frame. So there's still some, some data that we're missing, but um, it is a good alternative for patients that have a high risk of bleeding or a history of life-threatening bleeding bleeds. And um, so we talked about stroke prevention, you know, the first building block of therapy of atrial fibrillation, the most important one, I think. And then the two other building blocks of atrial fibrillation management, and that is heart rate control or heart rhythm control. And for that, we have a, a bunch of therapies and treatment approaches. And that's why you come to see me to you know, find what's best for you. It includes pacemakers, which you can see here, monitors that are implanted under the skin, new pacemakers that go into the bottom chamber of the heart instead of un being under, under the skin, medications again, and then also special procedures including ablation procedures where we cauterize or freeze areas in the heart that um, most commonly cause atrial fibrillation. And so that's just a slide that summarizes these different approaches. Again, to repeat, for rate and rhythm control, we have available medications that are 
controlling the heart rates, such as beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. Some of you may have heard those names. I don't want to be too technical, but a lot of you patients uh, are patients and will know those words. Antiarrhythmic drugs, and then devices and procedures. As we said, pacemaker placement, implantable monitors, and ablation procedures that can be minimally invasive or even open surgical. And so for some patients, we go the rate control approach. Let's talk about that for a bit. Some patients may not feel that they're in atrial fibrillation. A lot of patients will actually not feel that the heart is in atrial fibrillation. In fact, for 25% of, of patients that have atrial fibrillation, one quarter, the first symptom, the first presentation is when they're presenting with a stroke, when it's too late, basically. And so that just tells you, you know, atrial fibrillation can happen in your sleep, it can happen during the day and you just don't feel it. But some patients are really sensitive to this irregular heartbeat. But for those that aren't, we um, pursue something that's called rate control. And why is that? Well, we talked about it. Um, the atrial fibrillation can cause fast heart rhythms in the bottom chambers. And we don't want you to have a heart rate of 150 when you're just sitting watching TV. That's bad for the heart. If that is the case, you know, for three, four weeks or months on end, it will wear out the heart and can cause damage to the heart muscle. It can weaken the heart. Sort of like revving up your engine and idle in the parking lot and keeping your foot on the pedal for two weeks. That will damage the, that will damage the engine. And that's exactly what happens with the heart as well. So in someone that has atrial fibrillation, we want to reduce the heart rate in the lower chambers. And we do that with medications. Medications like beta blockers. Um, Metoprolol is something that some of you may have heard before. And then in some patients, these medications cause the heart rate to be too low when they're not in atrial fibrillation. So we really sometimes get into a bind where we need to treat them with, patient, with uh, medications to prevent the heart rate from being too fast when in atrial fibrillation. But then those heart rates drop to heart rates of 30s or 40s when in normal rhythm. And that can then also cause symptoms from taking medications. And so that's when we do something called belt and suspenders approach. The belt is the medication. It keeps your heart rate controlled. It cinches down the heart rate. And sus the suspenders is uh, the implant of a pacemaker, which watches over your heart rate and paces the heart when it's going too slow. So when we give a medication that slows down the heart rate, the pacemaker will not let the heart be too slowly. But on the other hand, we can give that medication to prevent the heart from going too fast when in, atri when in AFib. Is that clear? Okay. And, and again, those are two examples of pacemakers. This is a standard pacemaker, and I have examples of that as well with me here. I only brought, I couldn't find uh, a sample of, of this novel one uh, earlier today, but I'll let uh, two pacemakers go around, and again, I need them back. <laughs> so this is a conventional pacemaker that, um, of course, over the past 40 years has evolved into this very small device. It used to be, you know, probably a box about this big here that would be <laughs> external. But they're, they're, they have become really small and um, are implanted underneath the skin and the upper chest usually. And then there are two leads or one lead sometimes, sometimes three leads that go down to the heart via the vein that runs underneath the clavicle into the heart screwed into the heart, and um, that then watches over your heart rate and paces the heart when needed. This is a pretty cool new, pretty cool new device. 
which is called a micro leadless pacemaker. So it's not implanted underneath the skin, but actually implanted through the groin directly into the heart and it grabs onto the heart muscle from the inside and paces the heart. It has the battery included, just like this does have a battery included. Battery included that lasts between eight and 12 years. If it ever runs out, we can simply implant a new device. This is only for certain patients. Most uh, certain patients that have AFib all the time, those sometimes are good. Uh, those patients are sometimes good candidates for for this device. Yes. You mean for this device here? Yeah. No. So the body actually grows tissue over it with time and it, it becomes really difficult to get it out after years. Um, so it weighs just a few grams, it's really light, and doesn't affect the heart function. So what you do is you just implant a new device right above it or below it. And it, it's a leadless pacemaker. It doesn't have any leads. So, um, and if you imagine, uh, people have actually looked at that and looked at animal models. So uh, you can implant up to three of these devices into the heart safely without getting into any trouble. And this is an example of how this leadless pacemaker is, um, is delivered. And I have a little video here. I think it's pretty interesting for you to for you all to just get an idea of what I do, what we do in the um, electrophysiology lab. So you have this delivery system, let me go back, that consists of different parts that can be introduced in the blood vessels. And at the tip here sits the pacemaker. So I would make access to the vein in the groin with a needle with a regular needle, through that needle goes a wire. And that wire acts like a railroad track that goes all the way up to the heart, straight, straight up the vein, the main blood vessel, uh, the main vein of the body. And again, this wire serves as a rail for that sheath to go up the vein. We then take the, you know, we dilate it up to, to make the hole big enough for this sheath to go in. And then the pacemaker delivery tool goes up into the heart. I can push a button and it deflects down into the lower chamber, the right lower chamber. And then this is under x-ray. You see some contrast injected here. Once it's in a good position, we unlock and deliver it with this blue tool. Just slide it back. There's tiny hooks, tiny hook feet, uh, feet on, on the uh, tip of the micro leadless pacemaker and it just grabs onto the heart muscle and doesn't let go. And this is sort of a, an animal, uh, I think an animal uh, example of how this uh, pacemaker then sits inside the heart muscle. And an animation of these feet kind of being stretchy and grabbing onto the heart muscle. And we can then, to your point of when the battery runs out, we can put a wand, a wireless wand, over the heart, interrogate the pacemaker. We can do that with all pacemakers and see what's the battery status, what are the electrical sort of parameters, you know, sort of like a car inspection. Check all the systems. Yes? If somebody dies and you're after that transplanted, will that thing keep working? <laughs> That's it's actually a good question. So what happens to a patient? The question was, um, when somebody dies, will that thing keep working? Yes, it will. Um, so, and that is true for every pacemaker. Um, when somebody dies, and we all do, unfortunately, um, the heart at some point quits working, and um, that is not because the heart's own pacemaker isn't working anymore or because the pacemaker that may have been implanted stops working, but because the heart muscle cells 
become ill and just don't uh, react to any electrical impulses anymore. So when somebody passes away, a pacemaker will still try to pulse the heart, but uh, there's no response. It's sort of like, um, you know, touching an a, a, a electrical fence with, uh, um, with gloves on. Uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really uh, bother you. So it, it, that's what happens, and, and uh, the pacemaker just keeps on, keeps on pacing. For the bigger pacemakers that are under the skin, mm -hmm. um, do you change those out, or what, how do you do that? So the question was, uh, what do you do with pacemakers that are implanted under the skin? Uh, when the battery runs out, for example, or sometimes things break, you know, a lead breaks, and, and if, especially if it's been in for 20, 30 years, uh, every electrical com component can fail on a device. Well, then we open up the, the skin at the old scar usually and take out the old device, especially when there's just a, the battery comes to an end. We disconnect the pacemaker from the leads, screw on a new pacemaker that has a new battery, and tuck it underneath the skin and sew it all up. It's a pretty quick procedure. So we talked now, we covered two of the three topics, stroke prevention, rate control, now rhythm control. Um, rhythm control is for patients that are very symptomatic with AFib. So every, that's for a patient that says, every time in AFib, I'm in AFib, I have palpitations, I feel my irregular heartbeat, I become fatigued, I can't go for a run, I, um, I just feel terrible. And a lot of patients will feel that way, some won't. But for those patients, oftentimes a rhythm control strategy comes into play where we use special medications that are reserved for um, specially trained cardiologists um, to prescribe um, that can keep the heart in normal rhythm. And that was sort of the topic of, of today's talk. Um, let's get back into rhythm. And, and these medications affect the electrical properties of the heart muscle cells in a way that stabilizes them and keeps atrial fibrillation from happening and Are keeps safe? Uh, most of them are safe and uh, especially safe when you're in the care of a cardiologist because we know what to monitor for so some of these medications are a lot of these medications have restrictions and some of them we have to start while admitted to the hospital to make sure it doesn't affect uh, the, heart, the heart's electrical system in a way that may be dangerous. Some of these medications you have to be careful uh, with taking certain other medications like a Z-Pack. For some of these medications you can combine them. Uh, so it, it, takes some, uh, it takes some expertise to put you on the right one. But when you're on the right one, generally these medications are safe medications. Are one of those, is it, are those also Picasin? Yes. Yeah, I put the generic name, the Fetalite, on there. Yeah, I wouldn't say it was. It, it affected. I had the worst reaction that anybody right. at the hospital has ever had. Yeah, so it was just mentioned that uh, one of the patients here uh, was taking one of these antiarrhythmic drugs and had a bad reaction to it. Um, any medication can have side effects. And unfortunately, there is no crystal ball that I sit in front of that will tell me that you're going to have this reaction, you're going to, going to have that reaction. We do our best to try and get you on a medication that we think, from our experience, is good for you. But if, and that is true for every medication, be it cholesterol medication, be it uh, pain medications, or any other medication, anytime you have side effects, please talk to us. Don't just stop taking them. Sometimes um, it's okay to stop taking them and then talk to us, but talk to us so we can put you on something else. There is nothing more, there's nothing worse for me than hearing that uh, medication that I put someone on uh, didn't do the job it was supposed to and caused harm or caused them to feel, caused the patient to feel bad. I want to find the right thing for you and sometimes it's a little bit of trial and error and see what's good for you. Um, 
Rhythm control also consists of cardioversion, where we shock the heart from the outside with a paddle or with pads while you're sleepy. Um, that is sort of like an on-off switch. So we can reset the heart's electrical system um, with a shock to back to normal rhythm. And that is for patients when they're first diagnosed with AFib. Sometimes patients then stay in normal rhythm for a long, long time. Um, and it is sort of, again, like an on-off switch. It makes, you, makes patients that are very symptomatic feel better right away. Uh, we can also use medications to cardivert. And then the most advanced stuff um, is an ablation procedure. And these ablation procedures can be minimally invasive with catheters, where we burn or freeze areas that are responsible for heart rhythm problems, or we can even do open surgery, or a cardiothoracic surgeon would do that, um, to ablate or cauterize certain areas in the heart that are causing problems. And uh, here's another video of such an ablation procedure. And before I start it, I brought a few examples of ablation catheters that we feed up to the heart that you can uh, very carefully play around with a little bit. Um, and again, I need them back. <laughs> so for example, this is really, really going to be difficult to maneuver this. Um, but this is a you know, long spaghetti-like a catheter that we can feed up through the groin into the heart and then deflect with this rocker here. I don't know if you can see this really well. <laughs> but we can deflect it and move it around, you know, clockwise, counterclockwise, and get to the spot, find the spot inside the heart that's causing the issue. It has an electrode at the tip that we can get an electrical signal from and analyze the signal and see what are the abnormal signals and then burn them or freeze them. So I'll, I'll let these go around for just a few moments and you can look at them, touch them. Maybe. And we won't use these specific ones. <laughs> Here. Let's let this go around as well. And I'm going to start the video and explain what's happening. So again, kind of what you saw before, we put a sheath, which is sort of a plastic access sheath or access site, access port into the vein in the groin sometimes in both sides, and then feed these catheters up to the heart. While the heart is beating, obviously. Um, and in atrial fibrillation ablation, we cross over to the left side of the heart. We create an, a 3D map within, with a computer, a 3D map, an inside shell of the heart, sort of like a cast of the heart that is an electrical cast of the heart. And then burn areas you know, spot-wise or freeze areas inside the heart while it's beating to get rid of areas that are, um, that are abnormal. How do you determine what areas would be? So in AFib, the, the most common areas are the pulmonary veins. The pulmonary veins are the blood vessels that return blood from the lungs to the heart. And where the where the pulmonary veins insert into the back wall of the left upper chamber, sort of like my sleeve inserting into the body of the, of the suit, of the jacket, there is, a, there is a seam of heart muscle cells that can be electrically active, can create these rapid heart rates for whatever reason. We don't exactly know why that's the case, but it just happens. And we can create a scar around the pulmonary veins we can burn, cauterize that area, and that way these electrical signals um, can no longer spread over the rest of the atria. Yes, one second. <laughs> 
let me just come to the la last slide. It's my, my goddaughter I, uh, that was just born. So uh, I want to thank you again for, for coming and showing in such great numbers. And now it's the, t it's the time for questions. How do you get past that septum? There's not a hole there. Well, actually, there is. There is a hole there. It's called a foramen ovale, um, an oval hole that every one of us has as a fetus. So when we're in the mother's womb, that hole actually directs blood from the placenta to the left side of the heart and into the, you know, uh, into the body, into the brain of the, of the fetus. That hole usually closes up. Um, and in some patients, some patients have it for the rest, for, uh, for all their lives. Uh, it's not harmful. We don't usually use that hole. In most patients, it is closed up. But we poke a needle across it and uh, create a hole. And that hole inside the heart, after an ablation procedure, uh, scars and uh, heals. Yes? What would a good candidate for an ablation look like? What would a good candidate for an ablation look like? Um, someone that is very symptomatic with atrial fibrillation. Generally, I would say uh, early on is better because the longer you wait, the more difficult it is to control atrial fibrillation. Usually younger patients, but sometimes also patients that have heart failure. So very sick patients that have uh, uh, weak hearts are good candidates because there's actually some data that shows that these AFib ablations can, um, some data, not, not all data, it was in the New York Times, so it's very debated. But um, <laughs> some data that uh, shows that patients that have heart failure benefit from it in a way uh, that actually gives them an advantage of life expectancy. Uh, let's, we'll get to you all. Let's take the beer. Yes. And it, and it lasted two years, it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Now it's, it's the problem has returned. Right. Now so, the question is, you know, do you re-ablate mm -hmm. or do you just then go into your so the question is, a patient that had an ablation uh, was symptom-free and atrial fibrillation-free for two years after the ablation. Then it came back. What do you do then, and why does that happen? Well, as I told you, those three building blocks of the therapy, an ablation or rhythm control is a management strategy. It's not a cure in atrial fibrillation. We don't say that we cure atrial fibrillation. Because with time, uh, other areas can pop up that um, trigger atrial fibrillation. And um, it's sort of like, as, just like your skin wrinkles with age, your organs age on the inside. And there's these patchy areas of fibrosis or scar tissue on the inside of the atria that, can, that then lead to those um, heart muscle cells not functioning properly and triggering atrial fibrillation. And so sometimes we go back in and look for whether the areas that we ablated, well, maybe we didn't catch them the, the first time. Maybe some of that tissue recovered with time. Because, you know, when we ablate, we want to make sure that we create a scar and not just tissue edema. You can imagine sort of like pulling a pizza out of the oven. When you when you um, hit your forearm against the heating element, immediately what you will notice is swelling of tissue, right? And then after a few days or weeks, that tissue is no longer swollen, but what remains is the scar. The exact same thing happens inside the heart. As soon as I turn on the ablation energy, the heat at the tip of the catheter, the tissue swells right away. And that tissue swelling can uh, block electrical signals and suggest to me that I did a great job. I took away the AFib. But then weeks, months, or sometimes even years after, that tissue uh, lets electrical signals pass again. And so sometimes it is appropriate to do a second ablation, touch up certain areas that didn't, we didn't catch the first time. Um, but yeah, it's not a cure, it's a management strategy. Follow up, yes. How often does it 
do that. In other words, if, if you have an ablation and, and it disappears, what's the percent of yeah, good question. So for those patients that have episodic AFib, we call it paroxysmal AFib, so the sort of beginning stage of AFib, that it's AFib that comes and goes. You have sinus rhythm and paroxysm or AFib, and it kind of switches on its own between those two rhythms. Um, those patients have a 70% chance of being completely free of AFib after an ablation for the first three years. After three years, a lot of the seven, or some of the, not a lot, some of the 70% that was completely free of AFib start having some AFib again. And that's partly due to areas not having been ablated the first time. Uh, sometimes new areas pop up. So those are kind of the numbers. Patients that have persistent AFib that are constantly in AFib and not in normal rhythm, they have. Uh, a little bit less of a chance of being free of AFib after an ablation. But overall, an ablation is the most effective strategy. Yes? A question on your first um, thing that you said, your screen. Mm -hmm. Why is it, it looked like Wenatchee was the worst? <laughs> yeah. worst what, what would be the reason for that? I mean, you've got all this good, healthy activities outdoors and right I, right exactly um, so as you can see all the centers in in Washington state uh, you know where there's health care provided are high high density areas so a lot of this is probably because patients are actually seen by a physician Yes. So then the increase in the numbers projected as well is because we're thinking better diagnosing skills or more diagnosis? Better <laughs> diagnosing skills, people live longer and get more AFib. Um, but yeah, those are factors. There's probably many other factors. Um, the question was, by the way, why, um, why is the number of AFib increasing? And, I think that's the answer. Yes, please. An, abla an ablation of the AV node. Yes. Is that in the right atrium. The an ablation. The question is, um, what is an uh, ablation of the AV node, and is that in the right atrium? Um, the AV node is this area that I told you is the gatekeeper area of the heart. That. Uh, sits in the center of the heart, this yellow structure here, um, that keeps uh, impulses from traveling down to the bottom chambers too fast. Um, it sits, it's mostly accessible from the right atrium. Um, and we ablate that area sometimes in patients with AFib. Uh, I don't want to go into details, but that sometimes we ablate the connection, we cauterize or cut the connection between the upper and the lower chambers. Um, and usually we get it from the right side. In some patients, we have to cross over to the left and get it, sandwich it from, from both sides. Heart block. What is heart block? Question is, what is heart block? Heart block means um, many things, but the most uh, uh, common uh, or the most severe uh, degree of heart block is what we call complete heart block, where the natural function of the AV node is is uh, uh, deteriorated and where electrical signals do not naturally travel down from the top to the bottom chambers reliably anymore. Is that? Siri telling me that I have to go to Office Depot. <laughs> yes, please. At what point in time is a pacemaker the answer? Um, I would say, so that's a very complex uh, you know, question to answer very in, in two minutes. There's many indications for pacemakers, but for example, when your um, heart rate is high with AFib, we're talking about AFib here, so that's one of the areas where pacemakers come, to, come into play. There's many other areas where pacemakers come into play. But in AFib, when your heart rate is too high all the time, and we give you medications, and these medications slow down the heart rate, 
um, which is the wanted effect, but then slow down the heart rate too much when you're not in AFib. That's where the pacemaker comes into play. So the belt and suspenders. The belt is the medication that, um, that keeps the heart rate controlled and the suspenders keeps your heart rate. The suspenders is the pacemaker that keeps the heart rate at a certain lower limit. Yes, please. Uh, for many years, my doctors have instructed me to take a baby aspirin every day. And I've done that, and I haven't had any problems. But then the, I think it was the New York Times came down and said, don't take that baby aspirin. I don't need it. Yeah, so the question is, a uh, patient has been on baby aspirin for a long time and was told by her primary care physician, I suppose, to be on baby aspirin. Um, and now a New York Times article said that you shouldn't take it. Well, uh, the more we know about, so first of all, aspirin is a very important drug to, con to control many uh, cardiology issues. Um, for AFib specifically, some patients are on aspirin to prevent strokes when they have AFib. We know more and more that aspirin doesn't prevent strokes with patients in AFib. And um, uh, then aspirin still comes with that bleeding risk, incre increased bleeding risk, even though it's probably a one in a million chance to have a severe bleed while on aspirin. It's still more than than what you would want. And so um, to, give you, uh, to, to uh, give you a simple answer, for some patients, aspirin is a great medication, and for some, it isn't. <laughs> yes, please. Um, why does uh, rapid heart rate cause a stroke? Rapid heart rate itself does not cause the stroke. The rapid heart rate um, in atrial fibrillation um, is because the atria are fibrillating. So the heart muscle that's supposed to squeeze and propel the blood into the bottom chambers only fibrillates. And so blood flow sort of becomes stagnant and slow. And when blood doesn't flow nicely, it tends to form blood clots. Just like when you cut yourself, the blood that comes to the surface starts, you know, stops. It, it doesn't flow anymore. And that forms the blood clot, which seals off your wound. So it's a, you know, the coagulation that uh, saves us, that saves our lives every day. Um, but um, that blood clot that forms in atrial fibrillation can dislodge, go to your brain, and occlude a blood vessel and cause a stroke. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. So my friend who had a for atrial fibrillation uh, never quite returned to its baseline uh, exercise tolerance, I mean baseline prior to atrial fibrillation. Is that likely due to decreased pulmonary venous blood flow from the, or what, what is that likely due to, or not related? So a very um, difficult question to answer. Um, the question is, a friend had a atrial fibrillation ablation, and um, apparently atrial fibrillation didn't occur after, but the uh, friend still experienced a lot of fatigue and shortness of breath, despite having the AFib ablation. Um, well, there's many, many reasons why someone may be symptomatic with AFib and then still have symptoms after an ablation. One of them is that we all don't, you know, we all age, and some of that may be due to aging, deconditioning. So when you had AFib for a while, you may have become less active, more sedentary, you, your cardiovascular system deconditioned. Instead of going for a jog every morning, you don't do that for a few months and you start deconditioning. And then sometimes it's hard to reach your baseline. And then there are some, uh, um, complications of an AFib ablation that, of course, every, um, every invasive procedure has possible complications and risks. And one long-term risk that you were asking about was, is there maybe decreased pulmonary blood return? You know, as I told you, we make scar around the pulmonary veins. And when you make scar, sometimes that, star, that scar contracts and that can um, 
uh, can actually uh, make the pulmonary veins tight. It's very rare that we see that. But when the pulmonary veins are tight from scarring around them, then less blood can come to the heart. To the heart, it backs up in your lung, and that causes a lot of symptoms. Generally, so much so that you really become very sick. And um, then we can do certain things about that, like dilate the pulmonary veins. But it's something that happens very rarely, and uh, generally doesn't happen when you are careful to create that scar around the pulmonary veins just wide enough so that that scar doesn't make them tight. All the way in the back. Um, the, what are the indications for uh, patients with new onset AFib to have an ablation? Um, an ablation is mainly to control your symptoms. So if you are very symptomatic, um, that's the strongest indication to have an AFib ablation because you can get rid of it um, for the most part. Um, so symptoms of fatigue, shortness of breath, all those symptoms that we talked about. And AFib ablation does not alter your stroke risk. So you would, most, in most cases, not in all, but in most cases, still continue the blood thinner. Because we don't know if AFib is going to come back in the future. And right now, at this time of day, this time of day um, uh, we still continue the blood thinners. The uh, gentle lady there. Great question. So uh, what can people do to um, prevent AFib themselves and to stay healthy? Uh, yes, exercise is really important. So to prevent, to prevent heart disease in general, but also to prevent AFib. And um, the recommendation for the exercise recommendation that we have is 30 minutes a day of vigorous exercise five times a week. That's all you need to lead a healthy, heart-healthy life uh, from an exercise standpoint. 30 minutes a day, vigorous exercise. And I always tell my patients to a degree where you uh, start sweating or becoming short of breath from the exercise. That's the level of exercise that I want you to do. It's not uh, walking to the mailbox um, that, well, if it makes you short of breath, then that may be your level. But. Um, if we talk about actual activity, 30 minutes of dedicated exercise a day. And then um, a healthy diet, um, which uh, the healthiest, heart healthiest diet is a vegan diet. I, uh, I have not have yet to convince one patient to get on a vegan diet. Um, so to only eat vegetables. I've done it for six months and it actually is, is, a, is a great experience. Um, but uh, then I, I, what I can deal with is the lack of seafood. I can deal with the lack of fish, uh, the lack of uh, meat, but not the lack of seafood. Um, I think we have time for how many more questions? One more question? Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, although you, let's talk about after you had a question before. Um, yes, please, in the back. So the question is, uh, are there certain devices that you can't come close to when you have a pacemaker? Uh, yes, uh, there are. We don't want you to be nearby strong electromagnetic fields. And that, for example, would be bending over a running car engine. There is strong electromagnetic fields. Operating a chainsaw has uh, anything that uh, emits strong electromagnetic interference. Um, welding, arc welding, well, it depends on the arc welding equipment. Um, there are patients that use their arc welding equipment. There are certain precautions that you can take to weld safely. So I wouldn't say any, anything is a complete no-go, but um, uh, 
sort of, for example, going to have a, a MRI scan done uh, requires certain um, preparation and precautions in patients that have a pacemaker. You can still get an MRI done, though. It's more the uh, the engine of the of the device usually that you know of the devices that you're um, that you're describing where there is a you know a um, uh, electromagnetic field that uh, is created by the uh, by the spinning parts of the of the engine that, that creates the electromagnetic interference. Oh. Yeah, there's big big turbines there that probably may cause so may cause you to have some issues. Okay. Very la very very last question. I just got a comment. My father had a pacemaker in the late sixties and he wasn't allowed to go into a restroom restaurant that had a microwave. So a uh, question or a comment is, uh, in the late 60s, your father mm -hmm. had a pacemaker and was not allowed to go into, into a restaurant with microwaves, microwave ovens. And um, yes, so in the past, these devices were not shielded as well from electromagnetic interference as they are now. Nowadays, you can operate microwaves, no problem. Thank you so much for coming.